I was introduced to music at an extremely young age. Probably, I was probably like, the, my earliest memory of it is probably about six or seven years old. It's ironic because we're in my hometown right now and about three miles down the street is where I grew up at. And I have four older brothers and my music education started with them and my mom. My house was filled with music again since the day I can remember. Uh, so I was raised on everything from Elvis Presley to the Beach Boys to Motown to Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Black Sabbath, uh, Procol Harum, Spooky Tooth, Humble Pie, Montrose, 10 years after. Uh, I could go on and on and, and I didn't realize how great of a gift that was. Uh, it just was such a, a fabric of my life that I couldn't even imagine having life without music after that. Um, I grew up with my brothers again turning me on to all this stuff, inadvertently turning me on to it. It was things that I had no idea what it was that we were listening to and I would question like, who's that? Oh, that's the Jackson 5. Who's that? Oh, that's, uh, you know, um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. And these things just sort of, um, they molded me. And it was such an, that was the education. There was no such thing as genres or anything like that. Your music and how much you loved it was predicated on how it affected you emotionally. Even as a young kid, I remember just this happiness in my household, listening to, you know, ABC, you know, and the stuff like that. And for a kid, to see Michael Jackson as a seven-year-old kid dancing around and, and singing with more soul than 99% of the other artists out there, it just blew my mind and I could relate to it because he was a kid. And that was, uh, I think that was the, the first, my first introduction and in, in, uh, to not only music in general, but how powerful uh, music is and, and still is in my life. And I try to instill that too but blast the music around my house. I was doing it this morning, Jackson 5, <laughs> you know? And uh, I think it's really great to be able to pass that sort of thing down. I didn't get along with all my brothers, per se, but that music was our bond. It was our, uh, it was the glue that held us together. It was something that we shared. From being me as a listener to wanting to participate in being a part of music, occurred on December 16th, 1977 at Madison Square Garden at about 11.01 .01 p.m. when uh, I, about one minute after the KISS show ended, <laughs> I, uh, I realized at that moment, after being completely uh, just blindsided by this battalion of superheroes that laid me away. I mean, they were, it was like this freight train, this tank, this, it was like, Armageddon, man. I saw these larger-than-life figures, and they changed my life forever. And so I didn't know how I would be a part of it, music, uh, but I knew I wanted to do music for a living. And up until that point, music was it was the the language of my life. But I was a sports guy. I was baseball, basketball, and all that. I was a jock. And once I saw that show, everything changed. Everything changed in, at 11:01 .01 p.m. <laughs> driving home on a train from Madison Square Garden to South Amboy and uh, I knew things were different. It would change my life forever. Because I, I honestly thought I was going to be a baseball player. I thought that's what I was going to do. Um, my uncle was a semi-pro player so he thought it, that's what I was going to do and then when I <laughs> came home and was, you know, at age 13 going, guess what? Ain't happening. <laughs> it's going to be music. And it took me a year to find the guitar. But in that year, I knew that it would be music that I would be pursuing. It's funny because Rachel saw the same tour either a week prior or a week after in Philadelphia. And it had the same effect on him. Little did I know that this guy who was my age, living 40 miles away from me, had the same epiphany at the same time virtually and that 10 years later, we would meet, or nine years later, we would meet and form Skid Row for this, for this, for the for the same reasons that w from what Kiss did to us, that music we realized that 
you know, maybe we were uh, socially inept, uh, awkward, a little outside of the the cool kids, um, and we didn't just didn't know how to express ourselves. And through Kiss and through the musical upbringing that we had, we found our way, and all of a sudden found our way to okay, music. That's the, that's the great liberator. That's the that's the thing that's going. That's the the, the release valve. You know, that's the way that where I sit there and go, oh my God, like everything that I feel inside, I can get it out through music. Um, and he had the same epiphany. And then lo and behold, nine years later, these two guys meet in a random music store in Thomas River, New Jersey. And okay, let's, you know, start a band. And of course me, I'm dropping names like, <laughs> like nobody's business. <laughs> oh, I know this guy, this guy with this label, blah, blah, blah. blah. Because I'm looking at him and I go, that guy's a star. I gotta meet him, man. I gotta meet him. I gotta see what he's about. He's a bass player. He's got his own band. I'm a guitar player. I got my own band. We both are attempting to write songs. Let's see if we can write together. Well, okay. What would Kiss do? <laughs> and so at that time, that was that was the uh, sort of the the magnet that brought us together. But it's pretty amazing that that Kiss tour that year, '77, had the same profound effect as it on, on me as it did to this other guy from you know 40 miles away we end up starting a band and being in a band for 28 years together I've never heard of anybody making it with their first band <laughs> and my first band was a cover band and I think that I had a name for the band that everybody had which was Paradox and we used to rehearse in my buddy's basement uh, Andy McCara he lived up the street from me he lived across the street from Johnny Bon Jovi and, and so I was John was across the street doing his thing with the Atlantic City Expressway and then the rest uh, and then uh, John Bon Jovi and um, we were doing our thing playing I remember getting the first Motley Crue album as a import on Leather Records and I was like oh listen to these guys look at these guys you know and uh, I had discovered Iron Maiden and no one had ever heard of them so we are playing Iron Maiden songs and no one knew we were playing Saxon playing uh, Angel Witch, all these bands that no one knew what they were. And those bands uh, developed into uh, other cover bands with different members that kept moving on and moving on and moving on. And all of a sudden we uh, uh, had a cover band in called Steel Fortune uh, and then the singer that we had with us was Matt Fallon and he went on to play with Anthrax for about 35 seconds so that band broke up at that time and then he came back in the band uh, but I had started writing original songs and, and we started that was where Skid Row essentially started was with Matt originally in the band but uh, I, I mean I've had so I've <laughs> so many cover bands Paradox, uh, Split Decision, Steel Fortune who knows what else and uh but they all were just a, you know, they were great times because that's how I learned how to write songs was by playing other people's songs, listening to other people's music. And you always had bands with your friends and it was so, always so much fun. And, you know, we never got paid anything, you know, we, we made a couple bucks here and there. But um, the place where I'm at right now, Starland Ballroom in Sarville, New Jersey, Back in 1983, 84, I was the bar manager here. I was 19 years old, it's 84. I was 19 years old, I was underage. I had my band, Steel Fortune, and we opened up for the first show that Metallica played after signing with Megaforce Records, and they had just booted Mustaine out, and they flew Kirk in, and the show was here when it was called the uh, the uh, Willies, and that was in 1984. I still have the the quarter page ad in the paper. I said it to you. I thought, yeah, and I it's it says Metallica featuring material from their you know amazing new record Metal Up Your Ass, and then Anthrax talking about their EP, and then Steel Fortune featuring Dave Zabo, spelled my name wrong S Z A B O. One of the areas fine. Hi. Cool. Ready to go? Yeah, we gotta roll. <laughs> All right. We gotta roll. I'll finish up later. <laughs> F you. <laughs>